we have our former president and acting curator and all, so we're going to hear about uh, Lois's memories. So, turning it over to Lois. Well, hi to everybody. I'm glad you came tonight. Um, it's been kind of the last minute. I, I know some of the things I'd like to talk about, but they all start off with um, this little baby girl that was born on January 25th. Uh, the coldest night of the year in East Hampton, Mass. Well, what year? Oh, oh shucks. <laughs> 1934, but you really want to know. <laughs> um, the doctor uh, had my mother and father keep me in the bed with them for most of the week because it was so cold day and night, and uh, that's where I was. <laughs> so um, I was the sixth member of the family. I was the baby, and of course they say you're all spoiled, right, as a baby. I grew up in East Hampton, right at the base of the mountain. So we, we climbed up the mountain into the little pond up on our land a lot as young children. From there, um, I went on to go to um, junior high school and then high school. And I graduated um, in my senior year. I had taken commercial courses at school, so I went to work in one of the factories that made shoes uh, in East Hampton. And I was only there for a year. And then on to working in Northampton with the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty of Children. And I enjoyed that because it was working with families and children, and I had a very nice boss. <laughs> But uh, as I grew up, I um, became very interested in the 4-H activities and 4-H clubs. I started learning to sew. My sister was teaching me how to use the sewing machine when I was about eight years old. And um, I, you know, mended some clothes and things like that. I also worked around the house because I was the youngest. Uh, the rest of the family had to go out and work in the tobacco, um, but I did. I, I had to work in the house. But with that, I learned to cook and to sew. I had to help my mother um, put on the meal for the whole family. And we did things from scratch, uh, like going out to the chicken house and catching the rooster <laughs> first. Then she cut the head off. Uh, but I had to pick the feathers. So that was uh, our routine, or my routine as a uh, young person. And I had um, some sisters to look up to and brothers. Uh, we all got along fine. I got very interested in the 4-H uh, program as I started to get a little older. I think at that time that you had to be 10 years old. My mother had a small club, which I belonged to. I later on started exhibiting at the fairs. All of this time of my growing up, I participated in many 4-H activities. I went to the annual meeting in Chicago, representing the girls type work of sewing and cooking and so on. And back home again, and even though I was working, we did a lot with um, the older 4-H club, called the Service Club. From there, I went all over New England to different organizational meetings. I even went to Canada with one of the people from the university and met a lot of the young people there. And I also met a lot of people from Connecticut and other, uh, other states that were participating in this project. With this, I got very interested in the International Farm Youth Exchange Program. I really, really thought that was a great idea. So eventually, uh, when I was old enough at 20, I applied. And um, much to the dismay of my mother, um, I was selected to go to Japan. Ah, she thought I was going to the end of the earth. She thought she would never see me again. <laughs> 
Um, I was engaged to be married, and my boyfriend did not want me to travel. He did not want me to go to Japan. So it was kind of hard. It was tugging at my heart. But I was at the age where I wanted to fly my wings and get out and see the rest of the world. And it sounded so exciting. Uh, when I first applied for it, um, they thought I was going to France because I had had some French in high school. Well, thank goodness I didn't go to France because um, Japan was much better to go to. And I really enjoyed it. We met out in Iowa where there also was a young man who went to Japan. There was two delegates, two to Japan and two to uh, uh, another country. And so we had our introductions out there. Um, it was still early uh, in time, so that uh, we went by boat. It took us like 13 days going by boat. We had a grand time. <laughs> grand time, all you can eat and all you can do is swim, and et cetera, et cetera. The only thing is, there wasn't many young people. Uh, the, the four of us were the young people. And uh, so we sometimes had to make our own fun. But we arrived in Japan with a big load of people waiting to see us and waiting for us to get there. And somehow or other they twisted up our entrance to the country. But we got inside the country, we met all the people, and I can say I truly have met a lot of wonderful people from this country. In one place I went to, they had never seen an American woman before. So they were lined up outside of the door, uh, probably about 50 of them, or more or less, all the time, just watching me do my things. And were so happy to see me participate in their activities. Part of our responsibility was to um, help the family do their work. And in one family that I had, um, they raised tobacco. But not, oh, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, because I had done that at home, you know, that whatever they did. Well, I looked in the dooryard, and they had all these strings going across with leaves stuck into them. And I said, you know, why do you do that? Well, that was the way they cured their tobacco was to take the leaf and untwist the rope, stick the leaf up into that little space, and they just went down the line and made these ropes that were very heavy with tobacco leaves on them. And I had fun doing it, and, and I could do it very fast. Um, and I, I think it was because I had been using the typewriter, and the ends of my fingers were were good and solid, and it was, it was easy to do. They could believe it. They all sit there and just watched me. That was a big thing in Japan. They all sit and watched every movement you did, <laughs> just because they were curious. They were curious what an American girl would do. So um, that was one of the jobs that I did over there. Did a little bit of uh, pulling weeds around the rice paddies um, and, and various jobs, but they really just wanted to watch me sing or dance or do anything because we were just the third group that had gone to Japan. People still were in awe we of... Were very exotic. Yes. <laughs> and so we... Um, I did a lot of other things. The young man and I, we went by train and uh, to the, another prefecture, that's what their states were called, and we would then they would split us up and we would go on two different farms. So for about three weeks, we worked on the farms or with activities with 4-H clubs. Then uh, we'd get back together again and travel to the next prefecture. We went to uh, six families that summer, usually about three weeks per family, and the one place I still went to that they had never seen an American woman before. I, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was really very hard. But they were, the families were very welcome. 
and we enjoyed our stay, and we just had, it was a wonderful time in my life, very wonderful time. I have some pictures here. I will start passing some of these around. Uh, they are Japanese magazines, pictures. They had their um, cameras going probably all day long. They forever took pictures uh, of Americans. Yes. That's you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The funny one, I don't know if I have that here or not, is the one that they tried to uh, get us married. They, they put the young boy in the family, or one that was my age, I call him young now, <laughs> and um, they would dress us up. So it was really very interesting. And this had a, a great influence on my life. So I came home by boat and um, then took a train from the West Coast all the way into Washington, D.C., and we landed there about the middle of December. We had to go to Washington, D.C. to uh, speak to all sorts of people, the Agricultural Department and the State Department, and tell them what our feelings were about sending more young people over there. And then they finally released us, and um, my husband, my boyfriend at the time, uh, said he'd come and uh, pick me up, which was great. And it was great to see him, too. Um, it was very hard as I came home to give talks about Japan because a lot of Americans were very upset with the country. And a lot of them had lost a brother in the war. And it was very hard for them to accept uh, this. But, um, I still went on my way and I made over 350 talks when I came back from Japan. People were still interested. We had, um, you know, slideshows to show. We had clothes to get dressed up in, and etc. So a lot of people did appreciate the information about the country. My boyfriend at the time, he used to take me a lot to where we, I had speeches to make. And so we got very close. He gave me a diamond ring in July, and we were married in October in 1955. This is a picture of Roger and I when we were married. I made my gown from silk from Japan, the, the bottom part of it, and the top part had lace. And uh, the week after we were married, we showed up in West Whaley and been there ever since. <laughs> That's what the whole story was leading up to. Why did you get to West Whaley? Why did I get to West Whaley? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, my husband was a bean, okay? And of course, everybody thinks of beans being in Florence, because a lot of the bean family did live in Florence. But his mother was from Whaley. And her side of the family, and this is Sanderson, but it's not the Sanderson that's related to the one that's in the center of town. <laughs> so but, uh, she was a Sanderson. She married a bean. And Roger was one of her sons. At that time, there were no grandparents. Um, there was an aunt and uncle. They owned the house and the land. And we moved into their house. We made a little apartment upstairs in the house. Uh, we stayed there for about five years, had two children, it was getting too tight, so we decided to build a house across the road. My husband loved the area there much better than he did in Florence, me too, and um, so we built our house and had the rest of our children. That's the house that I'm living in now. So that, we just love West Whaley. It's, it's a beautiful place um, to grow up. Susie and Emery were left at the house. Neither one of them uh, was ever married. Uh, so they could move downstairs, and we moved in upstairs and made them the apartment. Emery, of course, had the old cars. I'm sure you've all heard about the old cars. And after he died, they had to be sold 
Susie bought one of them back, which is a Franklin, and gave that one to Harlan. She wanted to keep it in the family. And the other one was sold. And we never knew where it went until a couple years ago. And we found out it's down in Pennsylvania, Boyertown, Pennsylvania. It's in a museum and being very well taken care of. And Emery would have been so happy to know that's where his car landed up. I did have the opportunity to go down there. I'm very pleased with what they've done with it. They repainted parts of it, fixed it up. So that's still there. Um, it had to take Susie to the Historical Society. Um, she wasn't driving at night. And so this was my lead into becoming involved with the Historical Society. She, um, she loved to go, so I would take her down to the meeting. And of course then I got myself involved <coughs> and um, helped them raise money. We used to have our sale right outside the town hall at that time. It was in October. And you know what October is. It can be a very cold month. And we froze out there. We had coats on. But people came and bought apple pies. That, of course, was the biggest thing. And supported uh, our group of people. And we, when they built the new school and closed the school in the center of town, um, the Board of Selectmen approached us and asked us if we'd be interested in a room in the school. They were going to have one room for town officials, um, and uh, most of the rooms downstairs were going to be taken care of. First started off, the police department was down there. Uh, so, of course, we said we'd love to have a place to show the few things that we had at that time. Believe it or not, it was just a few jokes, a few things. As we moved into the school, we did gain uh, a lot of artifacts. And people would bring them in to us, saying, oh, this belonged to my mother, or this belonged to my father, or, would you like it? And of course, we said, yes. Um, we started with um, putting things on the computer, this was recommended that we do. Um, Ms. Dwight came in and did our computer work for us. Gert and I found information, talked to people. Uh, we had people coming in to see our jugs as our um, supply of them got larger. And we really have a lot of them today. We have a lot of clothing that has been handed down um, for many years. We have some beautiful uh, Polish um, dresses that the girls used to wear to church or when they were baptized. Um, we, we really have a huge collection. And I think Adelia can agree that we're running out of space. <laughs> and it's very hard, but we want to have, We I think basically of all the uh, societies for small towns around in this area. I think we're up to maybe having the largest exhibit uh, available to show. And I think it's something that our town needs to be very proud of because we uh, didn't used to have them. As a matter of fact, we, we didn't have anything for the bicentennial. It was the Historical Society was started before the Bicentennial, but they didn't have, we didn't have any artifacts. So I joined this group of um, Rudy Barbro and Liz Wright, and we worked in trying to get things set up as an official um, program. And um, Liz did all the computer work if she was good with that, she was used to it. I think we've had two or three updates on our computer since that time. Uh, so after a while, um, Gert was the president to the society, 
and then we came into, I think, right around 1990, and she felt she couldn't handle it anymore, and she wanted me to take it over, which I did. I was president from 1990 to, to 2003. Um, after Roger passed away, I just, he was my sounding board, I guess I want to say. And um, I had nobody else to talk and discuss the activities and decisions that had to be made. And so I, at that time, I did not go up for a re-election. And that's when Adelia took over. So that's um, a little bit about my life and how all these different things fit into it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you.